Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A very special good afternoon to members of the Tobago media, the Tobago population. Good afternoon to all our nationals who are in Trinidad and Tobago and those of you who are following us abroad. Welcome to rainy Tobago. We are once again gathered for a briefing on our COVID-19 situation and response. Thank you all very much for coming. I have with me today um, in person the Minister of Health and the Secretary for Health and on the technological system we have Dr. Parasram who will be joining us on the screen. I would like to begin today by asking Dr. Parasram to open with giving us our report and our overall situation and overview as well as our statistical arrangements. And after Dr. Parasram, I'll ask Secretary uh, Tracy Davidson to give us the Tobago specifics. And then I'll ask Minister Dial Singh to come in and then I'll come back to you. So without further Delay and ado, I would like to ask Dr. Parasram to join us and give us his input today. Welcome, Dr. Parasram. Hi, good day. Thank you, Honorable Prime Minister, Honorable Minister of Health, the Secretary for Health, um, Tobago, other ministers, members of the media, members of the viewing and listening public. So we will begin with a clinical update as of yesterday afternoon, 4 p.m., 23rd of October, with the total number of tests submitted thus far being 32,009 from the public sector and additionally upwards of 17,000 from the private sector, giving us at this point just under 50,000 tests done between Trinidad and Tobago, private sector and public sector. That gave us a total positive um, cases of 5,487 to date. Of those, 3,945 have recovered giving us a total active case load spread between hospital and isolation at home of 1,438. In terms of our new positives, as of 4 p.m., there were 41 new positives. Of that number, 11 persons came from a repatriation exercise um, from the U.S., and the other 30 persons were from a local source. The, with regards to today, I just received an update from the lab indicating that for the last 24 hours, which is as of, will be released as of 4 p.m. today, we have 16 new additional cases. Seven of those are coming from a repatriation flight that came through Barbados. So over giving us a total in terms of repatriation of 35 persons over the last week that have come from our repatriation flights, meaning imported cases, um, from a cohort of about 300 persons. So our repatriation flights are now giving us about 11% in terms of positivity rate. We, with regards to our debts, we would have had one additional debt overnight and condolences to the members of that family, taking our total number of debts up to 105. Our number of cases at hospital now stand at 71. Step down facilities at 42. Total patients in state quarantine facility now at 157, and total persons in home isolation stand at 1,317. With regards to a little more detail in the hospital breakdown, when we look at the Hoover Hospital and Multi-Training Facility, at this point we have 51 persons. At the ICU, we have three persons in that particular facility. HDU, we have 12 persons. In the Cora Hospital, it has gone down now to 16 at the Arima General Hospital is one positive person, and at the Scarborough Regional Hospital at the Fort, three individuals positive at this point in time. With regards to our step down, we have 42 persons, as I said before, spread amongst three main facilities, Claxton Bay Correctional Facility, which houses some of the persons that would have been coming across from Tobago and being positive at that point in time, inclusive of some additional prisoners from Trinidad, at the UV Davy Hall, there are 18 persons. And at the Napa, sorry, at the Tobago step down facility, there's one individual at this point in time. With regards to quarantine and the details of which will come out a little later today, 
So I won't go into any detail, but we have 157 persons quarantined at various facilities. We were able to discharge quite a number of those individuals over the last, over yesterday to today. So it took our numbers down a little bit um, from yesterday's tally. However, they would be spread over about seven or eight facilities throughout. And our repatriation, as you know, has been going very well. We're able to turn around a facility within eight or nine days and give us a large amount of persons being able to be accommodated in the quarantine sites. And therefore, the repatriation effort is expedited in that way. Thank you, Prime Minister. That's my clinical update for this morning. Thank you very much, Dr. Paraswam. And now we'll ask uh, Secretary for Health Tobago House of Assembly, Mrs. Tracy Davison Celestin, to give us a local report from Tobago. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Pleasant good afternoon to the listening public and to the members of the media who are gathered here today. I wish to just recognize as a part of our medical team here the County Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Hoyt, who is present, and also Dr. Wheeler, Medical Chief of Staff, and who is responsible for secondary care, and they would um, respond to any questions that might come their way in terms of their roles and responsibilities. I just want to add to the discussion information provided to me from the County Medical Officer of Health in terms of our statistics. Um, luckily, as at the 23rd of October 2020, we have no new cases. We have since had four discharges as at the 23rd of October. Uh, currently, we have 19 active cases, and they are disaggregated at, as follows. The green room, we have two persons. Um, at the COVID facility, we have none. At TREC, which is the um, Tobago Rehabilitation uh, Center, we have two persons, and then we have the remaining persons at the step-down facility, and then, of course, we have about 13 persons who were transferred to Trinidad um, from the prisons, and I've been informed that they are doing very well, and they have an additional week within which um, they would be at those facilities there in Trinidad. And so those are our statistics as of today, in addition to what uh, Dr. Parasram would have communicated to you um, in terms of our Tobago situation. I also want to add to the discussion that our systems are still in place and those systems are functioning very well. Um, we continue to meet um, very weekly in terms of the COVID uh, task force and our response to treating with the COVID-19 um, pandemic. We continue to review our systems and to update um, where necessary. Um, of course, I would want to communicate to the public as well we know that this is, in fact, a difficult time um, for all of us. And so we in the Division of Health, Wellness, and Family Development, including the Tobago Regional uh, Health Authority, we are working to ensure that your mental, social, and economic situation is taken care of at this time. We know of the hardship. We know of the loss and, of course, the mental toll. And at this time, we are at ground zero, but at the same time, we must go on in terms of our, um, in terms of our efforts. And um, this week, I think it was on Thursday, we discussed a motion having to treat with mental health. And we, of course, are very cognizant that our mental health and wellness is crucial and critical. And so I want to use this opportunity to urge every individual to reach out and talk to someone as we continue to face very trying times in Trinidad and Tobago, in Tobago, and the world over. I want to remind the members of the public that we have our helplines and our supporting services for calls. Um, we have established our hotlines, and the persons have been coming in in droves to the Division of Health, Wellness, and Family Development uh, to seek whether it be food support, um, rental assistance support, and of course, for us to continue to work with the Ministry of Social Development in order to access the salary relief grants. And so we are very poised, not only from the division, but the Tobago House of Assembly to work with each and every one out there in the community to ensure that we have the mechanisms in place that will allow our citizenry uh, to cope with the challenges, so to speak. 
Last but by no means least, I want to indicate that we all have an opportunity to re-engineer how we use technology for innovation. And I'm happy that within the government of Trinidad and Tobago, and even within the Tobago House of Assembly, uh, that there is a focus on um, technology. And we all know that the world of health has been shaken to its core, and so we have to embrace technology in this time and um, going forward. And we at the division, we of course are learning to become more agile and even more responsive with the use of technology, and that will even help us to uh, treat with our, our, our Tobago residents in a more predictable and um, effective and efficient way um, going forward. So as our economy continues to unfold from the limitations, um, I want to urge all of you that we have to be prepared. Um, we will again use technology to minimize contact, use it to keep track of our contact points, and um, again, I take this opportunity to remind each and every one of us to continue to wear your mask and to urge you, um, those out there, to keep, touch, keep in touch with those who are at risk at this point in time. And we at the division, as well as the Tobago House of Assembly, will continue to provide that level of social support and care so that we can all cope um, through this uh, trying time. Thank you very much, Secretary uh, Davidson Celestine. And now I'd like to ask the Minister of Health to give us his perspective. Thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister. Good afternoon to my colleague, the Secretary of Health, uh, Wellness and Family Services, Minister Young, Dr. Hoyt, Dr. Wheeler, ladies and gentlemen of the media, and the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, wherever you are. You would have heard the statistical report from both Dr. Paris Ram and the Secretary of Health in Tobago. Trinidad and Tobago is once again in a pretty good position when it comes to our caseload. We are averaging around 20 to four, uh, sorry, 30 to 40 cases per day. And when you take away the imported cases, we are in the late 20s to early 30s. That is a pretty good position to be in. Um, unfortunately, though, we have had 105 deaths, and our deepest condolences go out to those persons. What has accounted for us for being in this relatively good position? It has been a team effort of all 1.4 million people. We did this together, members of the public, business community, medical workers, and so on. But as we move forward from today, there's a very simple equation we need to understand. The more we move, the more we interact with people, the more we have to comply with the public health measures. That is, the more we need to wear masks, the more we need to social distance, wash your hands, clean your hands, don't go to work if you are ill, and most importantly over the next two months, limit the number of people coming into your home environments. If we, if we, if we don't do that, these numbers are going to be spoiled very, very quickly. And the doctors here, Dr. Hoyt and Dr. Wheeler, could attest to that. These good numbers we have in Trinidad and Tobago must be contextualized into what is happening globally. There are currently 42,725,665 positive cases detected around the world, with 1,152,253 fatalities deaths. Strangely, the average number of daily cases shows no sign of slowing down globally, although we are in the opposite direction. Honorable Prime Minister, it may surprise people to know that we are now touching 500,000 new cases per day around the world. New daily records are being set almost on a daily basis. There are seven countries that are now with one million plus cases and four countries over 800,000 waiting to join that one millionth um, club. Those are not good global statistics. There is no slowing down at the global level. Globally, 
deaths continue to show a third peak. Uh, there was a first peak, it went down, a second peak, now there's a third peak of about 7,000 deaths per day globally. In the Trinidad and Tobago context, if we continue with 30 to 40 to 50 cases per day, given our death, uh, our case fatality ratio of 1.77%, it means we could expect one to two persons per day, unfortunately, uh, dying of the disease. That is why it is so important for households with elderly people to keep your elderly safe. Best way to do that is if you have to attend to them, if they are sick on bed, wear a mask, wear a glove, social distance, and don't invite people into your homes, whether it's for a birthday party, uh, whatever, whatever celebration. Treat the elderly with a deep sense of regard and respect. Uh, as I close, I want to say again, I want to thank all healthcare workers. As we move forward, our healthcare system was never overwhelmed. We want to keep it that way for two reasons. One, so we could provide space for people who need beds, ICU, and two, to give our healthcare workers a much deserved rest. And I'm sure Dr. Wheeler and Dr. Hoyt could attest to that they need a break. And the last point I want to make, um, supporting my colleague who spoke about technology, um, we have engaged PAHO on a technological front, and there will be more to say about that in the coming weeks going forward. So, Prime Minister, that's my update on global perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Terence Dale Singh. I have with me today also Minister Stuart Young, who a little later in the proceedings will give us um, his perspective from the Ministry of National Security and he'll be able to take questions at question time. So at this time, I just want to remind the national community, notwithstanding the cost of the losses, the pain that we're feeling, the comfort that some people seem to be taking in the fact that we are not like some other countries that are having serious um, uh, returns to where we've come from. And also because we have been in this for what appears to be a long time that uh, tiredness is beginning to step in or even complacency. I want to remind the national community that everything we say to you here from Dr. Paris and the summary to my own comments uh, underpinned by the fact, the undisputed fact, that we are living in and trying to make life in a pandemic. 2020, so far for the entire year, we have all had to deal with a pandemic. It becomes uh, easy for some people to simply think about numbers. But when it comes home to you directly, there's an awakening that takes place. And I want to empathize with the hundred odd families and the many communities who have had to deal with the loss of family members, loved ones, friends, acquaintances, because it is when you face that outcome of the pandemic that you really know that we are in a dangerous phase. As I speak to you now, I have lost a very close friend and neighbor in the last few days to the pandemic. And even though I've been in this since January, today I feel very different because when it comes home to you that closely, it is difficult to think about a number, a number, or even a name. And I want to warn the national community not to get tired of responding properly to this pandemic because that is what is going to keep us all alive. Statistically, the minister speaks about 
the possible loss of one or two people per day. Again, that's a, statist a statistical expression. But think about it. Think about it in the context of the loss of a life that could be any of us in here. And that is the danger we're facing. We are pleased to announce that the efforts that we've made, and we're paying the price for those efforts, eh? because those efforts are not easy. Some people have lost jobs, some people have lost businesses, some people are um, mentally traumatized, some people have not been able to go to school, and we're being told that there'll be long-term uh, negative effects and all that and so on. But this is the outcome. But the ultimate outcome is firstly possible loss of life, and secondly, the medics around the world are telling us that there could be long-term negative effects even though lives would have been saved in the case of those who have been infected. So it's not a simple and straightforward matter. When we started out in January and more so by March to respond to this pandemic, our horizon of response was September. September. We are now into, in the next few days, into November. And as I monitor the scientific information coming from experts around the world, it is now being accepted that this situation could last before it disappears off the scene two to three years. Meaning that it's not going to disappear around the corner and it's not disappearing. In Trinidad and Tobago, we are in this position we are in now, difficult as it is, because we have taken some very difficult decisions that from a point of view of human preservation, we have been fairly successful, or I should say successful, but at a tremendous cost to our economy and to our personal lives. Our active case load is a bit down. That's a good thing, because remember, in August, we had to introduce constraints and withdrawals because we had an increase in our caseload that was very dangerous. We were being advised that if we did not do that, the numbers will escalate to the point where it will very quickly overwhelm the health system. And by quickly, there I mean in a matter of a fortnight or just over a fortnight, we could have overwhelmed our health system. Because of the action we have taken, that has not happened. And I think we've got a good result from the uh, sacrifices that we have been making. Um, to, with respect to the repatriation exercise that has gone on apace, notwithstanding what you have been hearing, we have been repatriating our people from abroad. Um, but when you look at it, a few thousand people wanting to come home and a few thousand people brought home, we are now being told that they are accounting for about 10% of the positives that we are aware of. Now that 10% sounds like a small number. But in relation to the rest of the population, that small population of repatriated being accounting for 10 accounting for 10 percent should give you a clear picture as to what would have happened had we not managed that inflow. And we also are learning as part of our operation in Trinidad and Tobago. We are learning about how things go elsewhere when they are handled differently. We know of countries that very quickly attempted to, what, there's one particular country that attempted to not have any kind of shutdown or lockdown and try to face down the virus in the street by relying entirely on a disciplined population to do the things that we're all trying to do around the world that Minister De Helsing just emphasized. For a while, that country was being used as a yardstick of an alternative success. Today, that country is in deep trouble in the same situation as the ones that started out in Europe with a real problem, and they now have probably the highest death rate in the world from COVID. So trying to face down the virus by ignoring its existence does not work. Even those people who had done lockdowns and so on and come to an area of low numbers as we had been, and when you come out to the increased risk, thinking that, well, okay, we got it under control and therefore we can go back to a normal pace of life. Most countries are now 
are now experiencing a reversal of that. And in Europe, there's a very serious situation in many countries. In fact, um, those of you who had followed the, the, the Commissioner of Police's vacation would have seen that he went to Ireland. Within 24 hours of landing there, Ireland's lockdown. Lockdown, not, not just withdrawal, but lockdown, because their explosion has been such that the response that was medically required was to literally shut the country down. So some of the things that we have been doing here casually, it's now nationwide there, in Belgium, in Wales, big numbers. And of course, I need not tell you about what happening, what's happening in the United States, except to draw to the attention of Trinidad and Tobago. The population of Trinidad and Tobago, 1.3 million, is about the size of a small United States city, small one. We are telling you today that we have been managing it with our health system not being overwhelmed. We have space in the health system to treat with the numbers that require um, hospitalization, our IC um, is available and so on. There are cities in the United States and small towns where people, as a result of COVID infection levels, where people are in ambulances driving around for hours looking for a place to deposit that patient. And when you get to that situation, you, should, you know you're in trouble because your health systems are overwhelmed. We have been able to provide health care to those who require it, hospitalization to those who require it, high dependency treatment to those who require it, and intensive care treatment to those who require it. Those are the facts in Trinidad and Tobago. And for that, I want to once again congratulate the planners in the health sector, the health caregivers across the board, because it is their dedication that has allowed us to be in this situation. But they're humans, and they will get tired. And we don't have an additional number of health caregivers in the event that our numbers explode like other people's have elsewhere. You require not just hospital beds. If you have the hospital beds, you require additional health caregivers, highly trained people who are not in excessive supply. And the population should bear that in mind. I know it is easy in Trinidad and Tobago to cry the whole situation, to bad mouth it, and to give the impression that hell is a proportion. On this occasion, I want you to be realistic. Compare our situation with others, and you see what might have been in Trinidad and Tobago had it been handled differently, had we behaved differently. It's not, it not, it's not a free ride. We're paying a price for that. But the benefit has been the preservation of life and limb and the preservation of a health system that could generate that health care that people require as and when their condition demands. In the Caribbean, we have um, we categorize our nations. The very small countries tend to be the ones that are reporting sporadic occurrences because small populations, limited contact. And for example, like Grenada, St. Kitts, they are in the sporadic category that you should be familiar with. We were there once where you'll hear the odd confirmation here and there especially in the early days of panic, when we didn't really know how virulent this virus was and the information from abroad was that it was deadly, as it still is. But now that we know a bit more about it and in managing the cases, um, that the death rate is going down, but the infection rate is going up outside the Trinidad. So we have some countries that are cat categorized as having sporadic cases. Then you have the medium-sized countries that are still reporting cluster, you know, and you may recall when we were in clusters, which is when you have a number of people in a small area and then another area and another area. And then, of course, the larger countries in the, in the CARICOM, a few of them, like Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, we are reporting uh, community spread. So in relating to our Caribbean people, we are looking to see to what extent we can reconnect based on the categories and the categorization of the state between us, Guyana, Suriname, Grenada, St. Lucia, and so on. And I'll talk a bit more about that a little later on. And um, what we really need to focus now on as we look towards 
responding on the longer term. Not lose sight of the fact that the actions we are taking with respect to the curbing of behaviors, those actions are in response to an understanding that the main threat to us as a population is the gathering of people. Human interaction. The more we are able to not interact at this time when an infection is in the air, and the less we gather, the better our chances of reducing, if not eliminating, the infection levels. So the objective is to suppress gathering and interaction. It's very difficult for human beings to do that. We are gregarious species. We love to come together, love to interact. But it is that interaction that exposes us to the virus. So the action that we take to separate ourselves, and um, we are being told by the experts what kind of negative effect that, that is having on us because it's an abnormal action. The, the, the desire to be, to be hugged, to be in the presence of others, not to be isolated, can have a, a negative biological effect on us. That is true. But in a pandemic, that is the danger. In fact, there's, um, I think it's in the UK, where they're specifying how many people should be in a household. And I think the number is six. Yeah, you, 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 and, 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 and their response, do not, um, do not encourage even your family to come visiting. Keep the numbers six and under in households. That's what Minister Delsin just mentioned, that we need not to. So telling humans, human beings that is like asking them not to be normal, not to behave normal. That is true because it's not a normal situation. A pandemic is not a normal situation. This has only happened the first time in our lifetime. And the last time it happened on this scale, in this way, was 100 years ago. If we mishandle it, if we mishandle it for whatever reason, we could easily end up like one of these small American cities where the ambulances have patients on board but the hospital doors are not open because they are full. We could end up, if we mishandle it, in a situation where the morgue is full and outside there are refrigerated trucks to hold people. We, from the beginning, we said our objective is try to avoid that. We've done that so far. As Prime Minister, I can tell you, I have been under tremendous pressure to normalize the operations of activities in this country for good reason, for very good reason. But at the end of the day, I have to take decisions with the cabinet and the team that is looking after this situation, first and foremost, to ensure that we don't do things that bring about more human interaction that is necessary. And if we do that, that we know that we are taking an increased risk and that we don't unnecessarily congregate because to do so is to invite an outcome that we have been trying to avoid all along and having said that maybe I, this, this is a good time for me to apologize to persons who are specifically affected by the actions because i know the time is coming when some people are feeling that they are carrying much more of the burden than the others but if you are engaged in an activity where the deleterious conditions uh, more predisposed to happen, then unfortunately you will be the one that will have to give up much of what you're doing. And that is basically what we have to do from time to time. So today, given the fact that the last uh, withdrawal that we've done in August, we ask for your patience, we ask us to behave properly and see what the numbers will do. We heard a report this morning from Dr. Parasram that we have a fairly good response our health system is in place to provide that service and we have been able to not go the route of an increase but fortunately as Dr. Hines would say a plateauing but of course those of us who've been in the geographical and geography environment would know when you're on a plateau you can go up to the peak or you can go down to the valley. We want to take the numbers down and not to have it go up to the peak so we're on the plateau. But to do that, 
we have to have a good foundation to keep building. So as we come out towards some semblance of normal activity, we must be doing so on a fairly good foundation. And that is what we have been doing so far. We started with a good foundation of the parallel health system. We started with a very good foundation even further back with a well-trained um, pool of health caregivers. We also allocated significant sums of public resources in, form, in terms of money, incur significant public debt to give us that foundation. Now, as we're stepping out, I want to indicate after very deep consultation and considerations for all, considerations for all, and trusting that the population would understand what we are saying to you and not have to go to put your finger in the wound to feel it. We're saying to you that as we come out, we are coming out to increase risk. And we have to be even more disciplined. Today, I want to make some adjustments to where we're at because the circumstances warrant some adjustments. And first and foremost, we want to thank Almighty God for being able to report to you in this way today. And for all those who are engaged in ecclesiastical work, we thank you for your support, that mental support, and of course, your places of worship which have been shut down. We want to go back to where we were at the beginning of the last withdrawal and to permit um, all places of worship to be opened up for services that should not last beyond an hour. Again, we're saying that the longer you stay together, the greater the risk, but we believe that in an hour, communicating with God, as busy as he is, an hour is a good way of a fair amount of time that he'll give to you. And of course, as you use the facilities for worship, we are expecting that you will follow the earlier protocol of spacing out and, of course, operate your facilities at 50% capacity, meaning that the cathedral, 50% is a larger number to a small church in the street or up the hill where you had 40 people, you only have 20 because we're asking you to use a 50% capacity. And we're asking you not to be smart and expect a policeman to come inside and count the heads and divide by two. Just be sensible. Just be sensible about it. If you're accustomed to having 100 people and you have 50 in there, you wouldn't know when, you wouldn't know when 50 percent is. Because if the police pass and see 75, they'll ask you to stop. And then if that happens, well, then don't try to blame me, your minister, your minister, the other thing. Blame yourself. Because if you cooperate, and it's quite possible, some of you are able to have two or three services a day or on a weekend. So instead of having a thousand people in one building at the same time, if you have three or four services, then all can participate and not expo expose ourselves. If we do that kind of thing, then as a country, we'll all be fighting the virus. It is when we deviate from the common sense and from the knowledge that will save us that we then make it difficult for all. We've had the public service home, ostensibly, on a rotation, on a 50%. Today I want to indicate that as of, to, as of Monday, the full public services to get back out to work and we are going to um, ensure that the managers, the, public, the permanent secretaries, under the instruction of the head of the public service and the managers at the various locations manage the workplace of the public service so that the workplaces can be relatively safe where you have your distancing, sanitized, and so on, and don't congregate around the water cooler, don't congregate and stop in, of course, uh, the elevator is to be used, but if you see five people in there, um, you may not want to go in and become 14. So these are things that are at the workplace where common sense arrangements will allow. But the public service would be open to provide the service that the public need, especially at this time. There are some ministries that are uh, absolutely required to provide service to those who are least able to look after themselves, and I expect that they would be fully engaged in doing that. We would open gyms at 50%. Again, we are recommending that you operate by appointment, operating from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., again, limiting the exposure by limiting the time. 
and allowing you to operate at 50% of your capacity and to the extent that you can operate by appointments, you can have more people pass through the gym. But please, again, you're not being smart from me or against somebody. If you encourage people to congregate in your gyms, in a place where if it is not properly managed and sanitized, it could be a super spreader environment. What you will be doing if you do that is to ensure that you get shut down in the very near future and probably take the country down with you as well. So if you want to continue at 50%, which could grow, maybe to 100% later on soon, if the numbers get down to the level that we are comfortable with full operation. But on the other hand, if you try to do too much, irresponsibly, you can guarantee it that you are going to be cutting your own throat. With respect to education, we are prepared to allow adults, post-secondary and tertiary education systems that cannot be done online to go back to where it can only be done at your, work, at your places of learning where you would have been before. And by that I mean um, laboratories. All people who are studying and you're online studying but you need lab work, the labs can um, they can, the, the, the educational institutions that require that could be communicated to the Minister of Health who will grant the exemption for laboratories and, um, for example, like um, flight school for um, aviation and all those things that cannot be done online, that you have, you have to go to the um, place of learning to do it. The Minister of Health will grant that exemption. But as you get it, remember, the caveat is you stay with the original protocols, physical distancing, sanitizing, and not congregating. And of course, at the workplace, certain kinds of uh, layouts and uh, prospect bars and so on would be useful in creating a safe environment because a safe environment is what we want as we come out from the, the withdrawal. Casinos, cinemas, theaters, and members clubs. Um, a fair amount of work has been done with the business community to, uh, who have committed to be very diligent in managing this particular situation. And because they are indoors, we again, we are coming out very cautiously here at a 50% capacity. But we have some caveats. Now, wearing of the mask has become probably the best response known to this virus. If you go to a cinema or in a casino and you are insisting on eating and drinking, we cannot be doing that with the mask covering your nose and mouth. And then the absence of the mask on your nose and mouth indoors becomes very dangerous. So if you're going to go to watch a movie or to play, to recreate at the casino or in the members club, we are having you to not have eats and drinks. Because to do that, to allow eating and drinking, is to allow you to have no mask on and to create a super spreader environment. So we are allowing these places to reopen at 50% capacity, but masked persons must be masked and no food and drink is to be available while you are indoors watching a movie like that or so. So that, that is the beginning of it and, we, and that is mandatory. If it is not observed, it will be withdrawn. There are guidelines that already exist with respect to these um, entities, and we expect that the Ministry of Health will re-emphasize re those guidelines, and we will go back there. The, the opening hours are from 8 to, 8 to 10. 8 in the morning till 10 at night for these um, casinos, bars, and so on. The area that we have the greatest amount of difficulty with, and I must tell you, I have been very open to the advice from all quarters on this matter, but because of the nature of the behavior of people going to bars and restaurants, and because of the number of interactions that I've just mentioned that will increase, we are not today in a position 
to add to the interaction by opening up further bars and restaurants for in-house dining and service. We're asking that you be patient for another two weeks and hopefully by that time, if we get the kind of cooperation that we expect in the context of what I've just opened up there, that we should be in a position to add to that our bars and restaurants for in-house dining and services. It is difficult for those persons whose livelihood is affected here, but one must understand that if we try to placate here, end up with a situation of congregations and gathering, and one of the out one of the one of the, the, the threads in the fabric of this service here is alcohol. Alcohol has a way of causing sensible people to behave in a less than sensible way. And we have seen, we have checked, we know what's going to happen, we see what is happening, and with all the attempts at finding a formula that will allow us to add those kinds of congregation at this precise moment, we have decided that the best thing for the country is to hold a little longer with the rest of the country and to add this. Um, what we are sacrificing here is recreation and congregation. People go to a bar to congregate. You, you, you want to drink with somebody. You want to talk to somebody. You want to lime with somebody. And after you have two drinks in your head, you forget about the Minister of Health and you forget about COVID. Right? That is the fact. We are not today in a position to expose the whole country to that kind of recreation. For a little while longer, we will have to sacrifice that in protection of the people's health. And the same thing, people go out to eat. It's a socializing. It's not that you have no food at home, it's that you want to socialize out there and indoors in the restaurant and you want to have a drink with them and so on. So we're sacrificing that congregation so as to allow the other kinds of activities to take place which are a little more vital at this time and we hope to bring them on once we behave properly in the next um, two weeks and the numbers continue to go in the direction that they're going. I also want to mention from, uh, from the standpoint of recreation and uh, economic activity to a certain extent, there has been a great anticipation of the recreation that comes about when we interact with the water. So beaches and waters around the country, coastal waters around Trinidad and Tobago will now be available for the population to use so you can go to the beach. But please, people of Trinidad and Tobago, all of you run to Maracas Beach tomorrow because that is precisely what we don't want. Do not or Kong Point, Pigeon Point. All of you don't run down there tomorrow. Because if you do that, if you do that, you would create the exact environment that we are trying to avoid. Because, thank you. If you all run out to Pigeon Point or to Maracas, Las Cuevas tomorrow, and all of you do what the human beings do, you go there to meet people. Because that's what you do. You want to go to be seen there. You want to go to meet people. You want to be there because the lime and the action is there. The COVID is there too. So please, if you want to go to the beach tomorrow or day after or very soon, it would be very advis advisable to go to another beach which you haven't gone to for a long time. Explore another beach tomorrow. Don't all congregate on the popular beaches tomorrow or during the week because you will be creating a dangerous environment and one or two super spreaders in or out of a bikini walking through the crowd. And the next thing we're going to get from Dr. Parasram is a report that there has been an upsurge 
in COVID, and when we trace it, it's going to be traced to one of our popular beaches, and exactly what we have been trying to avoid would have occurred. We could say no use of the beach and no use of the rivers. We are saying now today no use of rivers and ponds and cooking and partying, not even on the beach. No partying. Because that is when you do what we're asking you not to do, which is don't congregate and keep your spacing, keep your physical distancing. The partying will come later, but right now, not. And we have not today. We have not today opened up rivers and ponds. We've opened up all the coastline. So let's, for the moment, and while you're on land, I mean, we don't expect you to wear a mask when you go into the water. But when you come out of the water and you're on the beach among people, make sure you put your mask on. We believe that if we do that, the regulations come out tomorrow night, come into effect from Monday, right? So from Monday, right? So don't rush to the beach tomorrow. Don't rush to the beach on Monday. And try and protect yourself by not being in a crowd. So wherever you are going to go, and let us try to sustain this, because if the population runs to the beach and disregard these protocols. We who are required to respond to the virus and make the rules as to how we respond, we will have no choice but to make those errors on off limit again. That's the only choice we're going to have. So if you really want to enjoy the beach, as I'm sure you want to, let us do it in small doses as we go forward. And as the numbers come down to very low levels, then we can do much more of that. But you are required at the personal level to make these personal decisions. I mean, because the law applies to a number of things, it is logistically impossible for a police officer to be on the shoulder of every citizen. It's impossible to police every beach 24 hours a day. And of course, the beaches will be open from during daylight hours, right? During 866. Right? So that is when we would expect you to be there. And if you see a crowd, avoid a crowd. If you see a gathering, and again, I must mention, the gathering, the limit is 10 people. That remains. Groups of no more than 10. And in that 10, give yourselves distance. Um, Hotels and guest houses, you're allowed to use your on-site pool, your guests. Guests at hotels and, and, and guest houses can use the pool facility. In those facilities, you can go into the water there. Um, there's one sticky issue that remains and will have to remain for a while, and that is the border closure. We have managed our COVID challenge by closing our borders since March 12th, I think it was. And that has been important in that we have not allowed an unmanaged inflow of persons from around the world, some of whom are our citizens. We've had a, a system in place to bring our own people home, and that has been working, and um, working fairly well. Last week I was being told by, by the Minister of National Security there was one flight out of Barbados where we put together a hundred and a hundred persons to come home and by the time the flight was ready they all changed their mind. We had only 38 people. So while you hear some people talking about this and that and the other and we're trying to manage this situation those are some of the kinds of things that you get. But we take it in stride, and we've been, we brought Minister Young will come and give us a, an update as to what we've done. But I just want to alert you that we have, we have accelerated our exemptions, and the thought process that I'm looking at now is to keep my eye on the capacity of the health system to treat with people who require hospitalization. And that 10% coming from repatriated people, we keep our eyes on that because 
the level of infection in some of the areas from which these people come has been so for quite some time and will continue to be so for quite some time, given what we know. But I am putting together a small committee of the Minister of National Security, the Minister of Health, and the Attorney General tomorrow. And that committee's work is to try to get us to remove the exemption system and to allow persons to come home as flights are available. The reason why I'm able to think and to go down that route is because I'm now satisfied that we can monitor persons coming in by using uh, an identification of persons who can come home and quarantine at home. So the quarantine system would still be required. And depending from where persons come, whether it's from the low risk, the medium risk, or the high risk, the CMO could determine what kind of quarantine they um, would be required to uh, participate in. The technology now is available to allow us to have people monitored at home and their vitals monitored by the health department to see whether, in fact, they are symptomatic of the virus. So it is reasonable now to bring people home, especially if the protocol is that they come in after a certain aspect of testing, and they come in at will, transport um, permitted, and they go home. And if they require state quarantine for any reason, then that can be um, managed. I'm satisfied that this committee can report within a week and that the tagging system could be available and it will allow us to maximize home quarantine and that will allow us to maximize the inflow um, of persons who are outside, citizens of Trinidad and Tobago who are outside who want to come home and that will then result in an, uh, an elimination of this exemption system. I see this as a cautious reopening of our border. We are in deep discussion with some of our CARICOM colleagues. I, I spoke with the president of Guyana a few days ago at length, and we believe that we could begin to have um, more movement between our citizens and the Guyanese population the Grenada population, the Barbados population, because the level at which they're at is either lower than or equal to us, and we can begin sometime in the not-too-distant future to make um, more tentative, step, tentative steps with respect to the border opening. It is my hope that by the 2nd of November, we would be, which is just over a week from now, we should be able to very definitively put something in place and report to you um, with respect to this particular matter. The last thing that I have got in confirmation today is that we do have the ability now to do the tagging that will allow us to go down this route. So, in summary, masks and the wearing of masks, absolutely essential, must be enforced, must be sustained, at the personal level, it's protecting those around you and protecting yourself. So there's no easing up or relinquishing on that. And the mask is not a chin strap. The mask is only useful if it covers the orifices of your nose and your mouth. Once it's not covering your nose, not covering your mouth, it is useless. Last night I passed through a particular village that shall remain nameless and there were some limers by the corner. Everybody with a mask around their neck. That is not good enough. And sitting close to one another with a mask, of course. I presume if they saw a police car coming, they pulled up on the nose. That is not helping. That's not what you do. If you're out there, remember, the virus is going to enter you through your nose or your mouth. 
or it's going to go to somebody through your nose or your mouth, cover your nose and your mouth with the mask. Also, don't get tired of the original response. Sanitize. 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 Wash hands. Wash hands. Wash hands. And also, distancing. 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 If you are at a six foot radius away from someone even if the virus is there there's a very low chance of it getting to you so that distance is your barrier so that's where we are today and i want to just on a personal level i want to thank all the hundreds of you who woke me up this morning with your comments and best wishes for my my other 71 years thank you all very much for your best wishes Minister Young, um, National Security, come at this point and give us an update as to what's happening in National Security with respect, with respect to our repatriation efforts. Oh, that, that mic is, is operating? Yes, yeah. yes well, please. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. And um, allow me on behalf of my colleagues and the rest of Tobago and Trinidad to wish you all of the best for your birthday and many, many more happy returns. So just to provide the latest statistics with respect to the repatriation process that, as the Prime Minister rightly pointed out, has been on ongoing. We had closed the borders, I believe, on the 23rd of March. We had our first case of positive COVID on the 12th of March. The total number of exemptions granted to enter Trinidad and Tobago to date is 5,905. The total number of exemptions granted to leave Trinidad and Tobago to date, 8,046. And from the last occasion, the exemptions granted to enter Trinidad and Tobago from the 31st of August to the 22nd of October, a few days ago, is 2,573. The exemptions granted to depart Trinidad and Tobago from August 31st to 22nd of October, 1,815. Out of the 5,905 exemptions that we've granted, the major areas that we've repatriated our nationals from are the United States. Right now, that number stands at 1,395. United Kingdom, 258. Canada, 177. What we have been doing as well is identifying certain areas, so like all of our nationals in India, all of our nationals in Japan, etc., and granting them permission to come home. We are now at this stage where every week within a 10-day period, we have two flights, one from Miami, one from New York. We also on a weekly basis have a flight. These are all Caribbean airline flights from Barbados coming in, and what we're looking at there. Uh, some of the other jurisdictions. In between there, we've put on flights, Caribbean airline flights, other jurisdictions. We're going to continue that. And the process, fortunately, has speeded up. I'd like to thank the Ministry of Health for assisting us there and Prime Minister to use this opportunity as the Minister of National Security to thank all of the frontline workers because added to what the Ministry of Health has done, we have had our, tr our Trinidad and Tobago police service out there doing the law enforcement from the word go our defense force, our immigration services, our prison services have had their own challenges that they've overcome through proper planning. So I'd like to thank all of them for their continued work and to assure you, Prime Minister, and the rest of our population that we move into this next phase now where we're reopening. Whilst law enforcement will do their part, we really are asking individuals, please be responsible, exactly as the Prime Minister said. The last thing I want is for the police service to have to be sweeping through a beach to be issuing tickets to persons on the beach for not wearing their masks and for other type of irresponsible behavior, the gatherings of more than 10, which continue to be illegal. And Prime Minister, through you, to just make the point that all that the Prime Minister has announced today kicks into effect from after midnight tomorrow, so really from Monday, because people are asking the questions if it's applicable immediately. No, the, the regulations will be put into place from midnight tomorrow night, so it starts off on Monday. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you very much. And uh, that being our contribution, now is the time for questions, if you have questions. 
Um, let's start with questions for specific to Tobago first, if you have that, because we have our Tobago contingent of the medical fraternity here. So any Tobago questions, we have those first, and then we go to national questions. Is it okay if you don't have any, you know? Hi, good afternoon. Clayton Clark, Radio Tamron. And just have a question from, well, somebody submitted a question actually. Um, I have a Tobagonian returning to Trinidad and they're wondering if upon arrival at Piaco, uh, if home quarantine can be done in Tobago, they have to remain in Trinidad. Obviously, with the, the, the movement of persons and for persons coming across on an aircraft or on boat, it increases the risk. Right now, what we've been doing, and we haven't had any such cases, because the number of countries that fall into the category of sporadic or, or the, the low risk category, we haven't faced that. But we will have to make some sort of arrangement. The current system is... You spend seven days. So what we would want to do is not have the risk of persons coming into Trinidad and Tobago via international flight, then jumping on a flight to Tobago and potentially exposing themselves, if they're positive, to the persons who are on the flight heading to Tobago. So, so it is something we will have to look at and look at the numbers. But right now we would make the space available in our state quarantine facilities for the people for the first seven days as we have been doing from since the 23rd of March. All right, my second question is Tobago and Trinidad, but I'll start with Tobago. We, we had World Mental Health Day earlier this month and we had one of the doctors attached to the hospital talking about an increase in mental health challenges, suicidal attempts, etc. And we spoke with a, well, I, our station spoke with somebody from the Mental Health Support Association in Trinidad and about the increase in the purchase of alcohol or, or consumption of alcohol in Trinidad. Um, obviously, when they're saying all linked to the corona pandemic, is that something you all are aware of what has been done about that situation? Is it that you're saying that there has been an increase in the purchase of alcohol? Consumption, yes. Well, um, I, I don't have that information, but I, I wouldn't be surprised. But by the same token, um, the people who sell alcohol are the ones complaining the most. Exactly. So I, I would like to see that data from an official source. But, um, but this is something that is... Uh, a, it's not surprising that there are um, statements being made about and, and, and analyses with respect to human condition and mental health because we are being put in an abnormal environment. That's what I tried to mention earlier on when I started speaking this evening, that we, we are being asked to operate in an abnormal environment and some people react to it differently. And I would leave that for the medical fraternity to... Um, to this, um, I don't know if any of the doctors here want to respond to that, Dr. Wheeler or Dr. Hoyt, but I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't venture there. <laughs> but the specialists, the specialists have been talking about it, and I, I hope yeah. the minister and I, we don't have the, we don't have the, 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 the what shall I say, we, we are not properly prepared to treat with that in the way it should be treated with, and it's not something that should be dealt with through guesswork. Good afternoon, um, Lois Vincent, Guardian Media. I'd like to find out if any adjustments will be made to the Caribbean Airlines current schedule in terms of capacity and the amount of flights. That's one question. I'm going to lump these into two. I'd like to find out also if any changes will be made to water parks, public pools, and um, public transportation capacity as well. No. And, uh, sorry. Well, let's, take, let's take the questions one at a time, because uh, um, the, the first one you asked was? Caribbean Airlines. We, the last time I spoke to you, we did make a, a significant adjustment to Caribbean Airlines schedule to Tobago. There were only two flights to Tobago, mm -hmm. 
and we requested six flights. And my understanding is that that has been going on, and um, I have not mentioned any change in that for the moment. Um, so there are now six flights a day, or they, are, they can have up to six flights a day in Tobago now. And um, also remember that we have the two ferries running. So Tobago has some service, or some fairly good service. And as, a, as the numbers improve, um, the number of flights will probably get back to some sense of normalcy. The other one, the other question was about the use Community of pool. what anything that was not mentioned as having been opened up remains closed. What we said, we opened up the waterways around the coast, meaning um, beaches and waterways on the coastline anywhere in Trinidad and Tobago. We have kept um, we have kept the rivers and ponds closed because of their facilitation of congregation and gathering of the kind that we would want to minimize or eliminate at this time. And we also said that um, we, we are allowing hotels and, 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 and guest houses to use their pools. And for further clarification, community pools are not open at this time. I mean, um, while I'm here, I'd like to find out if um, when the when um, the COP returns, he will auto automatically be placed on quarantine. Will that mean that the acting COP will be there until he comes off quarantine? <laughs> Thank you, Prime Minister. So, the Commissioner of Police, when he returns, will go into quarantine, and uh, of course. The key will be here physically, so we will see how it works out. I'll have to have the discussion with the Police Service Commission. Um, it is something that we had uh, touched on some time ago when we were talking about parliamentarians, for example. Whilst I have the mic, Prime Minister. Before, before, I, before you leave that point, I, I, I trust that you would have seen the Chief Justice in recent weeks has been operating in isolation some element of quarantine. He, he, he did. He had and, a situation where he went into And quarantine. therefore, what that tells you, that it is possible to run your department right. while you are in isolation. I, I spend a lot of my time um, away from gatherings. I, 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 have, I minimize my exposure, but I'm at work um, for very many hours at home. So if the commissioner comes back and is isolated, it doesn't mean that he Correct. is not in charge. And in fact, what, what, what the law states is it is only if he is out of the country, so he'll be back in the country, or he's unable to perform his duties, he will be able to perform his duties. Prime Minister, to seek your opp the opportunity to just answer a couple of questions we're being bombarded with here. With respect to team sports, as the Prime Minister said a short while ago, we have not adjusted anything for team sports. You'd ask specifically about water parks. The answer is no, not at this stage. We haven't re reopened water parks. Um, Minister Dial Singh, we, I heard it, the Prime Minister spoke of um, nurses and general medical staff in general being tired. We know that um, we recently heard that the Cuban nurses were given vacation, whereas the local medical staff still have not been granted. Any word on that? So, thank you for the question. So, local medical staff at the hospitals that attend to COVID patients, we insisted about a month or two ago that the RHAs look at them on a rotational basis so they get time off. To the best of my knowledge, that system has been put in place. And um, I just want to continue in my opening statement, I did say we need to be cognizant of the fact that we don't want to overwhelm the healthcare system not only in terms of physical capacity, but the capacity of healthcare workers to continue to work. And we need the public to really work with us uh, to make sure our healthcare workers uh, don't get burnt out a second time. But we are taking every step to give healthcare workers as much time off, especially now as our case load is so low. Mr. Dial Singh, I'll stay with you. Um, I'm hearing about a 14 year old Venezuelan migrant called George Head. Are you familiar with the case? Yes, I am. Um, um, do, do you think or do you think the ministry can do anything to assist the, 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 the minor? Okay. 
So Cabinet had instructed me as Minister of Health in early 2019 to evaluate the healthcare system and the use of the free healthcare system by non-nationals. We went out and we did a study of what Trinidadians and Tobagonians were subjected to abroad to access free healthcare, also in the CARICOM region. Based on that analysis of what a Trinidadian or Tobagonian can and cannot access, a cabinet note was passed in June 2019 allowing non-nationals like immigrants free access to certain levels of care, that is, accident and emergency, you can get that free of charge, um, maternity services, any other type of service, um, we will not be able at this point in time to accommodate that free. That is a cabinet decision taken in June 2019 and we looked at what even our own nationals are expected to pay for when they go abroad. Good evening to Dr. Rowley on the panel, Corey Connolly Newsday. Good evening, Corey. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, much has been said about the restrictions, um, the COVID restrictions, from the Tobago Business Chamber as well as the Tobago hoteliers. They are saying that while much has been said about the need to keep down new, new infections, not much has been said by way of rebooting the economy and helping hoteliers and the sector generally progress post-COVID. Is it that the government is awaiting word from the post-COVID economic recovery team before making a determination on that? Or are there initiatives you could perhaps reveal now um, to kind of appease their concerns? Well, there the are some people who purport to speak for Tobago who nothing will please them. So I am not surprised that, to hear that because the facts are not borne out in that way. We have, at the beginning, been very concerned about Tobago's specific situation and we made available to Tobago what the government could have made available. There's one particular point of view coming from certain Tobago spokespersons that Tobago's business can only be and can only get a positive mark if the government pay off their personal debt mm -hmm. and if the government tell the banks how to treat with their business and the clients. There's a limit to what the government can do. We made a significant amount of millions available in grant form to Tobago for persons who are engaged in the hospitality trade. Hotels to guest houses. And the category is if the Chief Secretary was here today, um, he would have been able to give you the details of that, how small it was done on the basis of number of rooms. If you had a, less than 10 rooms, you got, a, a, you were qualified for a grant of a certain amount. If you were qualified if, uh, up to 50 rooms, um, 80 rooms, over 80 rooms, and so on. This is taxpayers' money, cash, that was made available to persons. Um, there are spokespersons who disregard that as being not of any value. Then we've also put in place facilitation for public monies to support initiatives from the hoteliers who want to get their business going again and so on. We've also made available money to pay the hotel staff who had lost their jobs during the closure, meaning you have a business, your workers were going to come off your payroll when you had to close the door. The government picked up some of that slack by making money available. And these are some of the things that the government would have done using taxpayer resources. And there are some people who disregard this all the time and regard that is nothing. It is nothing. It's not, it's not nothing. It is sharing of the burden, using the resources that we have to make sure that everybody gets a bit of assistance. And I can tell you, the population of Tobago has got, if I have to quote the, the, the opposition in the parliament, more than a fair share. We don't agree with that, but that is what is being said. And we can point to exactly what Tobago received. 
but those mouthpieces in Tobago, particular one person who has nothing good to say about Tobago, and everything in Tobago is bad, and the government has done nothing for Tobago, we dismiss that. You see, because the government has a wider national responsibility, but it cannot be truthfully said that Tobago's peculiar circumstances have been ignored and that we have not made specific provision for Tobago. Right? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Elizabeth Williams, TV6 News. Good, happy Good afternoon, Liz. <laughs> I have a different notebook today, but you will not be spared. I have a lot of questions for you. Um, and, and, and I have a watch. <laughs> um, happy birthday to you. I hope you enjoy the rest. Thank you very much, Liz. Okay. Some of my questions include the following. Um, well, let's, let's take them one by one. Yes. That, in terms that, of the first question, um, one person is concerned in terms of Tobago that the MRI machine is not working at the hospital. I don't know if the health secretary could guide me. Well, um, yes, uh, that is accurate. The MRI machine is down at this point in time. We had a technical team who would have looked to see what exactly the challenge is with that machine. And the recommendation is at this point in time that we purchase another uh, machine. Um, in lieu of that, we have the CAT scan services that is still ongoing. And so that will assist in making um, some decisions. Okay. Um, my other question is, um, Mr. Prime Minister, I know that you would have mentioned some openings, um, but what some families are saying due to online schooling, um, what is going to be in place? Are daycares going to be open, reopening, to help and assist the parents who, some of whom are leaving their children at home with the online classing and now have to go to work? Well, that, that system remains, the, the, the care of children remain the responsibility of parents. Mm -hmm. But um, the government has not assumed any responsibility for daycares. But what I do know is that the health department has warned us against opening up daycare centers because of the, um, the risk of exposure for young people, young, young um, children. So I do not know that at the central government level we can assume that responsibility, but um, if parents have difficulties and those difficulties are raised with their employers and the government is an employer, and in fact the government is the major employer in the country, that the employers will take into account the need to put some things in place to facilitate parents, either by allowing them, if it is possible and feasible, to work from home or to um, do, um, have their time when they report for work change and so on, or to rotate them as the case might be. But we haven't gone beyond that for the moment. Um, one of my other questions is, I, TV6 would have done a story with six-year-old Jaden Edwards of Bethel, Tobago, and him planting his garden. He said he was inspired by you. Um, what, in terms of him and his agriculture, are you looking at in terms of focusing more um, in terms of agriculture and more the curriculum, the changes in the curriculum, looking at more agriculture and even more science? Well, I'm very happy to see what young Jalen would have done because it's good to know that your living has not been in vain. I've inspired one person. I'm very pleased about that. But what that little boy's exercise would have done is to indicate to particularly his young colleagues that agriculture is interesting, it's enjoyable, and he did mention about um, actually selling his produce meaning that it can be lucrative and, uh, you know, if, he, if you do it as a career. What I'm aiming to do now in the environment that we are trying to encourage is to make agriculture more participatory at all levels. And we are focusing on ensuring that our lands are being made available, our access roads are being made available. We have made significant provision in a very stringent budget for agricultural expansion 
Um, there's a $500 million um, but, uh, allocation in the Ministry of Finance to fund certain agricultural initiatives. And we are encouraging, only last week, a last cabinet meeting, we took a decision, two decisions were taken to create some centralized focusing of the agricultural um, extension programs in the ministry and in the country as a whole, bringing them together. And you will see those kinds of things um, aiming to make agriculture more attractive because we need to have more farmers. And the technology and the science that young Jalen point to are the new things that we expect to happen in agriculture, in um, growing vegetables and raising livestock and in just generally producing more food so that we get um, better security. And um, I did see him making the point that he did here and he's trying to follow the maxim of grow what you eat and eat what you grow, even if you're growing it in your backyard or in a pot on your step. So it's, it's all good. If you have any more questions, we have a, if the, was that? Well, I, I guess what you were informed is that they'll be coming to the end. So um, if, if, you, if, you, if you have another question, we will we'll round it up. And, and um, because we're in Tobago, we will give you the opportunity to have a little more time. All right, uh, Minister Dial Singh, yes, early in the coronavirus situation, you mentioned in order to make any sort of predictions, the 100 figure must be reached. We have reached the 100 in terms of infection. Yes. Uh, what sort of trends, extrapolation, uh, have you all you're looking at? Right. So thank, thank you for the uh, question. So having had the experience of the second wave and done a statistical analysis of it, what we now know is that for every 30 to 50 daily positive cases, that gives you roughly a case fatality ratio of 1.77%, which basically means with a caseload of between 30 to 50 cases per day, approximately one person per day, unfortunately, is going to die. That is just what a pure statistic say. However, we can reduce that because the burden of fatalities is unfortunately and disproportionately borne by the elderly. Correct, Dr. Wheeler and Dr. Hoyt? By the elderly, those over 60, 65, mainly with hypertension and diabetes. And that's why I always plead with families to treat your elderly at home and put them in a cocoon. Don't invite people into your homes. Don't have birthday parties. Don't invite family into your homes because the virus comes into your home setting and unfortunately, the elderly are going to pay the price for that. So we could okay. mock that trend if we protect the elderly. Okay. That's it. Thank you all very much to Bigo Media and those of you who followed us on the national media. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your questions and more, most importantly, the national community, thank you for your patience and your understanding. Thank you very much.